Tonight, the secrets at Mar-a-Lago now coming to light. A bombshell new photo showing classified documents seized from Trump's Florida home, many of them marked top secret in bright red letters. The image included in a scathing report from the DOJ accusing Trump's team of moving and concealing documents in an effort to obstruct their investigation. Some of those files were covered in a desk in Trump's office, where it all means for the former president's legal future. Living without water tonight, many taps in Mississippi's largest city still running dry after a massive failure at its main plant. Others spewing only brown, undrinkable water. Some schools forced to shut down early, why officials still can't say when this could all be over. The neighbor nightmare, the bitter backyard feud, creepy displays and mutilated dolls appearing on one homeowner's fence, why the neighbor who lives next door says she couldn't even move away if she wanted to. The chilling new video from Ohio, a man pounding on the door of his ex-girlfriend's home until her father opens fire. The shooting all captured on a ring camera. Plus the Labor Day warning, more travel headaches expected as millions of Americans take to the skies. How five major airlines are now promising to pay back passengers for delays and cancellations. What you need to know to cash in. And 25 years to the day, the world remembering the tragic death of Princess Diana, how the legacy of the people's princess still lives on today. Top Story starts right now. And good evening. It's the photo fueling headlines all across the country. What the FBI saw, what the FBI found at former President Trump's home. A bombshell new filing from the Department of Justice shining a bright light on the secrets hidden at Mar-a-Lago. The singular photo providing the clearest look yet at what was found document after document clearly marked top secret, sprawled on the floor. Even to an untrained eye, the importance and gravity of these papers is unmistakable. But even clearer than that image, the text of the report itself, the DOJ accusing the former president and his team of concealing and removing those documents in a direct effort to obstruct the government's investigation. The filing also noting many of the documents were not sorted or stored in boxes, some of them even found in desk drawers in the former president's office. Senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell's on top of all of this. She leads us off tonight from the White House. This one image revealing distinct color-coded markings for top secret and sensitive files. Evidence, the government says, seized from a container inside the 45 office. The Florida domain of former President Trump, where he often receives guests. The Department of Justice, in a court filing, lays out serious allegations in stark new terms. That government records were likely concealed and removed and that efforts were likely taken to obstruct the government's investigation. The DOJ alleges Team Trump provided inaccurate information when they turned over 38 classified materials at a June 3rd meeting. Citing this declaration where an unnamed Trump associate swore that a diligent search was completed to locate any and all documents subpoenaed. However, the FBI developed evidence that dozens of additional boxes remain. Then, August 8th, the day of the search, the FBI found over 100 unique documents with classification markings, including three classified documents that were not located in boxes, but discovered loose in desk drawers in the 45 office. Pointing to the gravity of secrets, the DOJ said some FBI counterintelligence personnel and DOJ attorneys required additional clearances to even review the documents. My father-in-law has said he has nothing to hide. He did nothing wrong. Lara Trump says the investigation has been political. This is such a bad look, I think, for the Department of Justice now because it goes to further the notion that they are targeting Donald Trump. Today on social media, Mr. Trump reacted to that evidence photo, calling it terrible. The FBI threw documents haphazardly all over the floor. Officials say the evidence was placed for the photo. All right, Kelly O'Donnell joins us now from the White House. Kelly, I want to pick up where you left off, that image, because really it is unlike anything I can remember seeing, the cover of those classified documents. Do we know if there were concerns about releasing that photo? When we talk about sensitivity and com compromising investigations, do we know how they felt comfortable with, with releasing that photo? 
Well, part of the strategy here was trying to respond to things that the former president and his allies have been saying, but needing to do it through the process of official court filing. So this is an evidence photo, and it does not show any of the underlying classified material, but it does show those markings that make clear that anyone, even a civilian like you or me who might not be at all familiar with uh, these kinds of markings, would recognize that's something that stands out to try to rebut some of what the former president has been saying, that these were the kinds of documents that should have set off alarm bells to anyone working in the former president's office, that this is the kind of sensitive material that should have raised questions. So the issue here for the government was a way to try to make this information accessible to the public, but to do it in an official capacity through the filing and the use of an evidence photo. Tom? Okay, Kelly O'Donnell for us. Kelly, we appreciate it. That DOJ finally making it very clear that this case is not just about recovering mishandled documents, but the possibility that a crime may have been committed. NBC senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson on former President Trump's potential legal jeopardy. This evidence doesn't need a thousand words, maybe only six. Is Donald Trump in trouble legally? The new filing from the DOJ suggests, but does not prove, a couple of crimes may have been committed. First, obstruction of justice. The filing points to that, saying the classified records were probably concealed and removed in Mar-a-Lago. It's not clear whether Mr. Trump knew where they were, though it's worth noting the filing says several documents were in his office desk. And it's not even clear the DOJ would ultimately want to prosecute the former president on any obstruction charges. The prosecution of a former president would be unprecedented. They still have to have a very difficult discussion about what they ought to do. Not what they could do, but what they should do. A second possible crime? Lying to the FBI. The DOJ saying since its team found 100 pages of documents in a matter of hours, it cast serious doubt that Mr. Trump's team did a diligent search for classified material like they'd said. Here again, some key info is not clear, like whether Mr. Trump directed his lawyers on what to say. Because the facts are so strong here, they can only really hope that Merrick Garland uses his prosecutorial discretion to say it's not worth it. Some conservatives have suggested Mr. Trump should be held to the so-called Clinton standard, arguing if Hillary Clinton was not prosecuted for her handling of classified information, Mr. Trump should not be either. I'll take it in terms of the result. But experts say this is not that for several reasons. For example, the FBI at the time cited a lack of an effort to obstruct justice. We do not see those things here. But in Mr. Trump's situation, it's complicated. That investigation of Ms. Clinton is over, and so we know the facts. This investigation of Mr. Trump is ongoing, and so there's plenty of stuff we don't know. Hallie Jackson joins us now from Washington. So, Hallie, for the FBI to take this extraordinary step, right, of raiding a former president's home, seizing those documents, and then the Department of Justice, right, releasing this photo, do law enforcement and legal experts think it really just ends there? So here's the thing, Tom, they really don't know, right? The only people who know that are the ones leading the investigation, and they are not talking except for what they're revealing in the documents that you've been sharing and that we've been talking about here tonight on the show. I mean, the question is, they have laid out, as we have talked about here, the potential, maybe, for two crimes that could have been committed, at least, obstruction of justice, possibly, and maybe lying to the FBI. But the question is, Tom, would they even move forward with prosecuting a former president, which is unprecedented, even if they did feel like they had enough evidence to prove of obstruction. That is still an open question. And from the, the many legal experts I've talked to, they say that is almost certainly the subject of extremely intense debate happening right now inside the DOJ. So as you know, the midterms are coming up. And I know the DOJ usually doesn't like to interfere with el elections, right? Hillary Clinton probably has an opinion on that one. But, but couldn't you argue, Hallie, the damage politically has already been done? So the, the Department of Justice has this sort of custom that they've often followed about not taking overt investigatory steps in the weeks before an election. It's not like, a, I think, a, a for, super formal rule, but it is a tradition that they've followed. It is not clear right now whether they would apply that custom in this instance or even, I think there's an important point to make here, even if they would, meaning the, the filings that we've seen so far over the last several weeks have made clear this investigation is in its early stages. So experts that I've spoken with say, it is unlikely that the DOJ would even finish this investigation and be at the point where they would want to take the next steps before November, Tom. Hallie Jackson breaking it down for us here on Top Story. Hallie, we thank you for that. The other major headline tonight, that water crisis in Mississippi, 
The capital city of Jackson still without running water and so far no word on when it will return. Families now lining up for bottled water and schools forced to close down. Morgan Chesky is there. In Jackson, Mississippi, bottled water disappearing just as fast as people's patients. I've been in line maybe almost an hour. One case per car for a crisis hitting 180,000 people. No water, no water pressure, no nothing. Today, officials said a new water pump should help. How much longer before the people here can be confident that the water coming out of their faucet is clean? Well, they can be confident that the water that is coming out of their faucet is clean when we um, tell them that it is clean. Uh, obviously, uh, right now it is not. The plant, part of an older Jackson water system that could cost more than a billion dollars to fix. A pricey problem experts say is already playing out nationwide as aging pipelines give out. A lot of it was built by our grandparents and our parents and our great grandparents. No engineer designed a water system to last that long. You got to face reality. At some point, it's going to have to be replaced. In Rockdale, Texas, unfiltered water looking more like coffee after officials said sediment broke off inside old cast iron pipes. Flint, Michigan and Newark, New Jersey now investing hundreds of millions to replace lead pipes posing poison risks. Back in Jackson, lack of water cutting schools short at Christ United Methodist. You don't think that that's what you have to worry about when you're going to work or sending your kids to school is, are they going to have water? They can't use a toilet. It doesn't have enough pressure to use it. No bathrooms. No bathrooms. Mother Kelsey Shack asking leaders to do better. I'm very frustrated. It's very sad because the whole community is suffering. You just feel for that mom there. Morgan Chesky joins us now live from Jackson. Morgan, you've been on the ground now seeing this problem up close. Can you explain to our viewers just how difficult is it or unbelievable that this situation is happening right now? Tom, I want to point out the fact that when I talked to the people here and asked them about this plant going offline, they said they've been under a boil water notice for the past month, and this is just proof of a bigger problem because of these aging water lines here. When I was inside that school, I saw a pallet of bottled water. I asked the principal, how much longer will you have to rely on this? Tommy looked at me, he said, we don't know the answer to that. And so that's why we may end up turning to the public and asking for donations. One of those mothers told me that she brought bottled water for her child when she dropped her off in the morning because she didn't know if the school would have enough. It, it, just, it, it just, it gets you really upset. You know, this country donates billions to other countries. We saw you point out there that the plant needs a billion dollars to be fixed, to be revitalized, but the governor can, can't give you a timeline on, on when they're going to fix this problem? Tom, he can. He said, well, his goal in a perfect world would have been today, but he says because of the problem they inherited, meaning the state inherited, that they simply do not know how much longer this will take before they can have a level of confidence in saying that everyone in Jackson, when they turn that faucet on, should have clean water coming out of the tap. I should note that it is the city of Jackson's responsibility to man this plant that has gone offline, but repairing it, taking on a billion dollars in repairs, the city here will no doubt need some serious help. Tom? Morgan Chesky for us from Mississippi. Morgan, we thank you for that. For more on the impact of the crisis there in that state, I want to bring in Jackson native and community organizer Maisie Brown, who's on the ground there volunteering. Maisie, I, I know something interesting is happening there to, to people you know. They're, they're getting water, but in some cases it, it, it looks foul and it smells foul. Yeah, the craziest part is a lot of people think, and there are some parts of Jackson where people are just not getting much pressure or any drip at all. But for a lot of my friends in the, re in the recent days, as the pressure has gone back up, um, the water looks fine. Um, and it seems as if it's back to normal, but it has a really foul smell. Um, or for some people, we know they, they've alerted us already that the water um, is not safe to drink. Don't use it to brush your teeth. Don't use it to cook with unless it's boiled or you buy it elsewhere. So I think that's kind of the very confusing thing about it for a lot of people right now. Maisie, can you put this into perspective? I mean, I mean, for us here reporting on this and covering this from New York, I mean, it, it, it's unbelievable that this is happening in a city in America in 2022. So, yeah. so talk to us about this. I mean, you're from there. When you got there and you saw what was happening, what did you think? 
Well, the crazy thing is, so in, if you're if you're from Jackson, even if you're from the Jackson area, um, boil water notices are is something that you're not un, it, that you're not. Um, it's not uncommon that you're accustomed to. Yeah, it's yeah. it's very common. We seem to have boil water notices literally every month, but they only usually last for a couple of days, maybe a week. But it's never lasted this long um, and impacted so many people at the same time. Um, and so I also think that you know, hearing from our state officials that there's an indeterminate the amount of time that this may go on or that it's indefinite that this water is not safe to consume without proper precautions. Um, it's really scary. And it's it's crazy to think about happening in a country, you know, like America and a state like Mississippi, when we're supposed to be leading the charge um, on, you know, clean drinking water, basic human rights. And we can't even provide that to the citizens of Mississippi and specifically in Jackson. I know you're working on the effort to get water, bottled water to, to residents there in Jackson. How difficult has that been? Uh, so right now, what um, our team, which is a team comprised of about 20 to 25 students, a lot of them Jackson State University students were, um, I'm a junior political science student. Uh, we came together, we said, hey, there are so many people here in Jackson um, who need the water, who don't have the transportation, the access, the physical ability. Um, they may be a part of the elderly community. There's a lot of distri distribution going on around in Jackson, but we kind of saw the need for actual transport and delivery of these items. Um, and so people um, have a text line that they've been texting us or DMing us on Instagram or, you know, getting information for their grandparents or older people that they know so they can request um, water to be delivered right to their doorstep free of charge. You don't ask anybody for anything. Uh, we're just trying to make sure that access to clean drinking water happens for everyone. Regardless Has it been of difficult, though, to get to get that get that bottle of water, get that clean water to them? It was difficult in the beginning um, because a lot of the stores here were sold out. Uh, very fast. I went to the, a few Walmarts. I went to a couple of Kroger's. Um, it was hard at first, but I found a little more success in going to surrounding cities, um, like the hardware stores. Crazy enough, prices online are ridiculous for bottled water. Like uh, on Amazon, a 24 pack is like 20 to 25 dollars, and it's normally five dollars in the store. So we had a little bit of difficulty just kind of getting some water in the beginning, and, and having um, not having the funds, but just being able to find it. But we're finally getting more water donations, which we strongly prefer over monetary donations if people can. Um, and we're, we're finally getting our groove. Finally, finally what's, getting... what's your message? What's your message for what's your message for President Biden? tonight you said who's my message for what what's your message for president biden tonight if you could talk to him what president would you tell biden him? <laughs> president biden we need help we need help and we need help now um this should not be the condition for any person not uh, across the globe let alone in who's supposed to be the model of democracy and basic human rights so we the people here in mississippi the blackest state in the nation um need federal intervention because our state leadership has not provided um that and that guarantee of safety and basic human rights so we need all the help we can get regardless of you know what state leadership may be saying and people on the ground here are looking to those um at the top for guidance on what to do next and how we can keep this from happening to other communities. Maisie Brown from Jackson, Mississippi tonight. Maisie, we, we thank you for that. The devastating situation. They're really unacceptable in Jackson, Mississippi. It's not the only state suffering the realities of severe weather, a historic holiday heat wave bringing record high temperatures to the West. We've been telling you about this all week. For more on the danger, I want to bring in NBC meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Michelle, what are the next few days going to look like and just how hot is it going to get? Hi there, Tom. Yeah, we're looking at historic. It's dangerous. And we're looking at record breaking, not only daily records, monthly records, but also all time records. We're going to see temperatures 25 degrees above normal for this time of year, close to 115 in some spots. So we do have 15, 50 million Americans under a heat alert, a heat advisory that's in the orange. That includes Seattle, the Northwest, Intermountain West. And then we have an excessive heat warning that's in the hot pink. That includes portions of Northern California, Southern California, portions of Nevada, and also areas. Arizona, Sacramento, Los Angeles, you could see your hottest temperatures of the year so far. So this is going to be a big story, not only today, tomorrow, but over the next seven days, because this is a prolonged event. We're looking at temperatures tomorrow into the triple digits. Once again, upper 90s in some spots, 101 in Salt Lake City, 106 in Fresno, 111 in Lancaster. So no doubt we'll break some records tomorrow. And this will last into the weekend and beyond into the holiday weekend. Early next week, we'll see some relief finally. But by Friday, we're looking at temperatures in the triple digits. Once again, Fresno 109, Palmdale 109, Las Vegas 109. And take a look at some of these temperatures through Saturday because we are looking at temperatures in the triple digits in Sacramento. 
Notice these alerts are through Monday. So we could see some spots even seeing alerts through Tuesday. And that's going to be the problem. We're not seeing the relief at night. We're not seeing the relief during the day. That's when it gets really tough on your body. So Sacramento by Sunday, 111. Monday, 113. We're looking at Los Angeles, 101 on Sunday. Temperatures near the triple digits on Monday. And Tom, we're going to break some records here. We're looking at a September monthly record possible to be broken and also an all-time record. Back to you. When it is hot at night out west, you know it's dangerous. I also want to ask you about what's happening in the tropics because we've been monitoring what's what's been developing out there. Yeah, you know, it's they're starting to wake up. We've, they've been very, very quiet. So we're looking at statistics that we have not had a name storm in 59 days. Now, it's until 11 o'clock tonight where we get that next advisory to see if we're going to see a name storm. Most likely we're not. But we are watching three areas in the Atlantic where we could see some tropical de development. But still, I mean, it's been a really quiet August. It will be a quiet start to September. And it has been 25 years since we haven't had a name storm in August. So most likely this year, 2022, will be added to that list. But let's take a look at what's happening right now. We do have three areas where we're looking at some possible development, but two in the Atlantic, one coming off the coast of Africa. It looks like the one near the Windward Islands or at least east of the Windward Islands. That has the best chance for development and 80 percent chance of development. The one to the north has 80 percent. The one to the right has 50 percent. But it looks like the one in the central Atlantic has the best chance of making sort of impact on the U.S. This is very far out still. Some of the models are showing that, but some of them are curving them off to the right. So, Tom, we still do have some time with this. Okay, we will watch and see what happens. Michelle, thank you for that. I want to turn out to a new video showing a deadly shooting on the front porch of an Ohio home. A man firing at his daughter's ex-boyfriend as he appears to try to break into the house. Prosecutors not moving forward with any charges. The whole thing caught on ring cam. Julie Serkin has more and a warning. You may find the following video disturbing. Tonight, new video showing the deadly encounter on the porch of an Ohio family home. Mitchell Ducro of Sydney shot and killed 22 year old James Rail last month after it appears Rail tried to break into the house where his ex-girlfriend Allison lives. In video captured by a home security system and provided to NBC News by local police, you can see Rail first ringing the doorbell multiple times. He's like, hey, he's coming back. The family saying they asked him to leave, and then... He's the door. Dad. No, don't answer the dad. Be off the porch. Dad, no. Oh, my God. Can you please hurry? Rail is shot three times. We've paused the video to obscure this graphic moment. He stumbles backwards and falls to the ground. Two minutes later, a bystander walks up to Rail's lifeless body. Okay, well, he's not moving. He'll have a gun. Did you shoot him? Yes. Oh. Okay. Call the, call the, uh, hey, sir, we know. We've already, we're on the phone with him right now. Rail was pronounced dead at the scene. He broke through the door and my dad shot at him. Audio from the 911 call confirms Allison Ducro phoned police while Rail was on the porch when she says he tried breaking into the family home. The pair previously dated but broke it off some time ago. The circumstances of their split not clear. The family interviewed by police. Once I realized he was getting in and the door was open is when I shot Rail's sister, Jessica Colbert, says her brother went to the house to, quote, look out for Allison. He's there for a friend. Colbert, emotional at the loss of her baby brother. I fell to my knees. Because it couldn't be true. He's not supposed to die before me. Last year, a new stand your ground law went into effect in Ohio, expanding rights for individuals using deadly force in situations of self-defense. Prosecutors in this case deciding not to move forward with any charges against Mitchell Ducro. I think not only should Mr. Ducro be held accountable, but so should the other people involved that did not do a full investigation. But on that day, one month ago, Allison was grateful for what her father did. Bro, I'm not mad at you. Thank you. Come here. I'm okay. Thank you for saving me. I do the best dad ever. You just saved my life.
All right, Julie Serkin joins us now live in studio. We do want to mention that last piece of video was some body cam from police as well. So, so the sister you spoke to seemed to insinuate that the investigation was not over. What, what, what do we know? Yeah, she told me that the investigation was not complete. And tonight we are hearing from the Shelby County Sheriff's Office who dispute Jessica's allegations, saying they conducted a full investigation. The sheriff noted he understands the Rails family grief and added, and this is interesting, quote, a young man lost his life, and there have been many other options. But the law is the law, and we take oaths to uphold that law. You know, I do want to ask you, that the ring cam, it's, it's a little tough to tell. Did, did, was the suspect actually able to get in the house, the ex-boyfriend, or is it just sort of a, a back-and-forth tug-of-war with him trying to break the door down? Yeah, Allison's father actually said that the suspect, the ex-boyfriend in this right. case, tried to gain entry, his shoulder actually starting to push that door open when he was fatally shot. All right, we're back with a deadly police shooting in Ohio. Newly released body cam footage showing police in Columbus fatally shooting a black man in his bed while they were executing a warrant. And now officials are investigating if the victim was only holding a vape pen. Gabe Gutierrez has the details, and we should warn you, the following video is disturbing. It is a split-second decision that tonight is under a state investigation. Come in now. We've stopped the body camera video right before 20-year-old Donovan Lewis is shot. The encounter began around 2.15 a.m. Tuesday in Columbus, Ohio. Police say officers were trying to serve a warrant to Lewis for improperly handling a firearm, assault, and domestic violence. Columbus Police! Officers knock and identify themselves. The police chief police. says eight to ten minutes go by before anyone answers. Eventually, two other men come out and are detained. Police send a dog in, then leash the dog before approaching a bedroom and opening the door. Police released the video just hours after the shooting. As you're looking at this frame by frame, there appears to be something. He raises his hand. You can see Lewis's left arm on the bed, his right arm coming over his body. Here's that moment from the body camera of the officer who fired. No guns were found at the scene. The police chief says a device appearing to be a vape pen was later found next to Lewis. I grieve with our community, but we're going to allow this investigation to take place. Tonight, an attorney for Lewis's family saying we will get justice for Donovan and do everything in our power to stop these senseless killings. According to Columbus police, the officer who shot Lewis has been with the department 30 years. He's now on administrative leave, and the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation is looking into the case. Tom? Okay, Gabe, we thank you for that story. When we come back, the travel tips you'll want to hear before this Labor Day weekend. What airlines are now promising to passengers who experience cancellations or delays and what you need to know to cash in? Stay with us. All right, we are back now with Top Stories Newsfeed. We begin with a bomb threat at one of the nation's top hospitals for children. Police urgently working to track down the source of an anonymous threat made to Boston Children's Hospital overnight. Some parents unable to see their children for several hours as a bomb squad swept through the building. No explosives were found, but the scare coming amid growing threats aimed at doctors who work with trans youth at that hospital. Agents at Chicago's O'Hare Airport making a startling discovery. Take a look at this. The TSA seizing a meat cleaver, two saw blades, multiple knives, and two screwdrivers. All of it coming from a single passenger's carry-on bag. Agents say the person didn't know the items were prohibited and was allowed to board after they were confiscated. No word yet on any charges. All right, the FDA has officially authorized the latest Pfizer and Moderna COVID boosters. The latest vaccines target the highly contagious Omicron subvariants, Pfizer's latest booster now authorized for people ages 12 and older, and Moderna for those 18 and up. People in those groups who have already gotten their first two doses are now eligible. And more than a third of Americans will travel this upcoming holiday weekend. And according to AAA, many will be heading to Sin City. Las Vegas is the number one travel destination this Labor Day. San Diego, and a little surprising, that's number two, and Orlando rounds out the top three. All right, speaking of travel, we head to Money Talks now, what consumers and investors need to know from the business world and beyond. Some relief for passengers after a summer filled with travel nightmares. Major airlines announcing some updated policies before this holiday weekend. Blaine Alexander has the details you need to know. 
After a long summer of flight delays left millions of Americans reeling from travel headaches, tonight relief is on the way. American, Southwest, United, Delta and JetBlue Airlines each rolling out updated policies, spelling out what passengers will receive if they are stranded. Meal vouchers for delays more than three hours. And if you're stuck in a city, a hotel voucher plus transportation to and from the airport. The airlines are clear this only applies for problems within their control, like mechanical issues or staffing shortages. But weather delays are not covered. Those policies will all be laid out on a new website from the Department of Transportation launching tomorrow. The airlines acted independently and voluntarily, but with pressure from Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, who spoke exclusively to NBC's Tom Costello earlier this month. We want to make sure very clearly spelled out so that passengers know what they're getting when they buy a ticket. So what does this mean for passengers? It's not that no airlines were providing meal vouchers or hotel vouchers before this. It's just that it was spotty. It depended a lot on the agent, on the airline. And going forward now, it's not going to depend on those things. And it all comes as more than 12 million passengers are set to fly this holiday weekend. According to Hopper, that's even higher than the numbers we saw back in 2019 before the pandemic. Back to you. All right, Blaine, we appreciate it. Now to Top Stories Global Watch. The destructive hailstorm in Spain that has turned deadly. Video showing the massive hailstones, some bigger than a softball, pounding the Catalan region. Officials say a one-year-old baby girl was killed after being hit in the head. At least 50 people injured in this vicious storm. The Taliban marking one year since the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan with a show of force in the capital city. Hundreds of Taliban fighters parading past the former U.S. embassy in Kabul waving flags and weapons from their cars, others gathering at the gate, brandishing guns and joining in chants. The Taliban declaring today Freedom Day, a national holiday to celebrate the final U.S. troops leaving that country. And an American nun who was kidnapped in West Africa has finally been found alive. Sister Sue Ellen Tennyson had been missing for nearly five months after she was abducted in the middle of the night by armed gunmen at her Burkina Faso convent. The 83-year-old is now back in the U.S., and she is awaiting her return to, I'm sorry, she's now in the U.S. care and she's awaiting her return to the States. Details of her rescue have not yet been made public. Okay, we want to head now to the latest in that deadly flooding in Pakistan. A large portion of the country is still underwater after an unprecedented monsoon season. Survivors now facing a lack of resources and food. Our Ali Aruzi has been following that story. An unprecedented monsoon season slamming Pakistan. With torrential rains and flooding tearing through towns, destroying almost everything in its path. A third of the country underwater. According to the Pakistani government, the monster floods have killed more than 1,100 people. 33 million people, or one in every seven Pakistanis, has been affected by the floods. Now, the survivors face a new challenge, hunger. Our team on the ground visiting this relief camp in Peshawar, Pakistan, where families lack basic necessities, children are getting sick, and this man says they've only been fed rice since arriving at the camp. People crowding supply trucks, begging for food and water. And some residents telling us they regret not taking the earlier warnings to evacuate seriously. Like this man and his family, who were asleep when the floodwaters came, saying, we didn't believe the government and ignored its flood warnings as the weather was clear and there was no rain in the town. But since the monsoon season started back in mid-June, torrential rains compounded by melting glaciers brought devastating floods. Government officials say Pakistan is the country with the most glaciers outside of the polar regions, placing it directly in the front lines of possible disasters brought on by climate change. Pakistan contributes negligible amounts to the overall uh, carbon footprint, but we do, uh, we are devastated by climate disasters such as these time and time again. Most of the destruction falling along the Indus River, the worst affected areas being in the southern regions of the country, with the government estimating over $10 billion in damages. 
army helicopters pulling people to safety and dropping off supplies. I haven't seen any destruction or devastation of this scale. The Pakistani government struggling to keep up with the need as the international community steps up to help. But for the families in Peshawar, little relief. Most have lost everything. And with more rain expected in September, the fight for survival continues. Tom, the sheer magnitude of the destruction and devastation is hard to fathom. If you take a look at the before and after satellite images, vast swathes of the country have changed. Green fields are now covered in brown water. Pakistan was already in a financial crisis. This latest catastrophe is only going to make life more difficult for the world's fifth most populated country. Tom? Those images are so unreal. All right, Ali Aruzi and our team from Pakistan, we thank you for all of that. Now to the war in Ukraine, where a team of UN inspectors have arrived at the nuclear plant we've been reporting on for a, for a couple weeks now. It sparked radiation fears as heavy shelling continues near the facility. Josh Letterman has the latest from Ukraine tonight. After weeks of delay, tonight, UN nuclear inspectors are finally in Zaporizhia on an unprecedented mission. Next stop, the sprawling nuclear power plant that's become a major flashpoint in the war. Do you believe that the Russians will let you see what's really happening at the plant? Well, we are, we are a team of very experienced people, and we will have a pretty good idea of uh, what's going on. The team will spend several days at the plant and hopes to have a permanent presence there. Are you confident you can conduct this mission safely? Uh, of course. As Russia and Ukraine accuse each other of more shelling near the plant, Russia welcoming the delegation, saying the IAEA must stop Ukraine's nuclear extortion. The inspectors now face a perilous journey about 30 miles down the Dnipro River to the power plant in Russian-occupied territory, where there has been constant shelling for weeks. Further south, Ukraine claiming successes tonight in the Kherson region as part of its new counteroffensive, while Russia insists it's been a failure. But this former Marine, now fighting alongside Ukraine, disagrees. I'm confident and hopeful that, you know, soon enough, uh, all of uh, the currently occupied, you know, villages um, all the way to the, to the Russian border will be liberated. And tonight, the EU also agreed to tighten travel rules for Russian citizens by suspending a visa agreement from 2007. But they stopped short of a full visa ban. Tom? All right, Josh Letterman for us. Josh, we thank you for that. Still ahead tonight, one woman's nightmare neighbor, several doll heads, mutilated toys, and threatening signs on her fence, all of it coming from her next door neighbor. So what is behind this bizarre backyard feud? That's next. Back down with a property dispute nightmare, a small disagreement between two Alaska neighbors about a fence and a property line turning ugly and just downright creepy. NBC Stephen Romo explains. Just north of Anchorage, creepy decorations are out early in one Alaska neighborhood. These mutilated doll heads hover above a fence, one head on a stick. This one, with nails in it, even says, Hail Satan. But this disturbing public display is not the result of early Halloween decorations. Nobody should live like this. What are we sending a message to? in the community that this is okay. This Google Street View image providing a clue, one sign reading, I like my neighbors, except this one. We were really excited to come up here and be with our family. The disliked neighbor is Miss Moore. She asked our affiliate KTUU not to use her full name. Shortly after moving to this Wasilla neighborhood, she found herself at odds with residents next door. And when we had the survey, that's when everything went horrible. She says a property survey revealed an old fence didn't quite match the property lines. And after a new privacy fence was constructed, signs started appearing. Faster way to get to heaven. It's got a, a gun. There's um, assault rifles out there. Smile, you're on camera. We're tired of hiding bodies. We got a backhoe. Basically, you can go on Amazon, take your pick, and I probably have it in my backyard. And along with those signs, those creepy doll heads appeared. The neighbor responsible declined an on-camera interview, but told NBC News the grievances piled up over the last two years. After the property line survey, she would cross over onto our property, so we started putting up no trespassing signs. We kind of had it, so we started being childish, and we put up a ton of signs on the fence saying that she's a Karen, and I put up those hideous dolls because I think they're funny. 
Nobody should live like this. What are we sending a message to in the community that this is okay? The neighbor from hell signs even getting political. One saying they voted for Biden with an arrow. Moore tells our Anchorage NBC affiliate that she has a Veterans for Trump sign clarifying her political leanings and that she would consider selling the property, but some real estate brokers won't even consider the listing. I would love to see in the community a difference made in turning this around and protecting people and their homes and their investments um, and being able to enjoy their quality of life. Until these neighbors can come to a peaceful resolution, these signs are likely to remain long after Halloween. Well, so far, it appears no laws have been broken in this situation. But the signs and the yard decor, they could be a violation of the subdivision's rules and restrictions. Back to you. Stephen Rommel for us tonight. Stephen, we appreciate it. For more on the legal side of this disturbing dispute, I want to bring in attorney Mike Mandel. He joins us now. He's got more than 6.7 million followers on TikTok who look to him for legal advice. So, Mike, I got to ask you, does Miss Moore have any legal recourse here? Uh, this one's tough, Tom. Uh, with visual nuisances, what I kind of call this, uh, courts are very unlikely to get involved with it. So your best bet with these type of situations is to see if you're in an HOA, get them to enforce the HOA rules for aesthetics um, and visual appearances of your home and, and your neighbor's homes. Uh, if you don't, it's an even tougher battle um, because nuisance law, which applies to uh, basically loud noises or lights or obstructions um, that interfere with your, your happiness and enjoyment of your property, uh, don't really apply to things that are on your neighbor's property um, that aren't going into yours. Where does, uh, where, but where does freedom of speech or property rights possibly end in this case versus, you know, you're getting harassed? Yeah, I mean, the, to be honest, in most cases like this, the freedom of speech rights are going to trump um, any form of harassment uh, that might be, uh, you know, uh, felt by the uh, other neighbor. Uh, the it's that neighbor's property. They can do a lot with it. But again, what this neighbor will want to do, the one that's um, complaining about these these different dolls and and signs on the uh, fence is to look at the local zoning laws, uh, local ordinances, see if there's anything about uh, appearances of houses and what they can and can't have on their property. Hopefully that will give them some help. But other than that, it's going to be a tough road to sue them in court. So, uh, so Mike, you're, 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 you know, you're a big time lawyer. If, if your neighbor was next to you with the, the spiked baby heads and, and all the signs saying, you know, interesting things about you, what, what would you do? As much as you'd like to think that I'd be, you know, running to the courts, uh, the first thing that I would like to do is talk it out with the neighbor. If you can't do that, you want to look for a mediator. Uh, a lot of communities have free medi mediators that you can use to help resolve issues like this. And then lastly, if you can get other neighbors to join with you, sometimes there's more power in numbers uh, to convince a neighbor to stop this type of behavior. What, but the, the, the last issue there in the story, she says real estate brokers are telling her they won't take her listing because they, they don't think they can sell this house. I mean, it, it, there's no legal recourse there? Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. Again, if we were talking about noise pollution, uh, other types of pollution where it goes into the house and diminishes the property value, it's much easier to prove under the law. Visual aesthetic things, it's kind of a subjective, uh, you know, uh, opinion as to whether it's devaluing your property. And courts are normally not inclined to get involved with these types of matters. There are a few states that have uh, certain laws about spite fences, which are things put on, uh, fences put up or objects put up specifically to spite your neighbor. Uh, if you can prove that, those courts will get involved. But again, it comes down to your local city and state laws. Bite fences. All right, we learned something new. Uh, Mike Mandel, thanks so much. We do appreciate it. When we come back, remembering Princess Diana, how she's inspiring young people around the world even 25 years after her death. That's next.
We have all evening long been covering an unfolding story that took a uh, very, very tragic turn with confirmation from Buckingham Palace tonight that the world has lost uh, Princess Diana at age 36, a dead in a car crash in Paris. That was Brian Williams breaking the news on Princess Diana's shocking death 25 years ago today. And now a quarter of a century after that fatal car crash, her legacy lives on. And she's even inspiring those born long after her death. NBC's Kelly Kobiea has more. Tonight, flowers at a Paris tunnel and a London palace for Princess Diana. A quarter of a century after her death, Diana still enthralls and inspires. Images of her compassion seared into our memory. Her meetings with Mother Teresa, holding the hands of AIDS patients. That compassion is part of the legacy that Diana leaves behind. It's inspired 16-year-old Olivia Hancock. How much do you know about Princess Diana? She was so important to people in the world. Her legacy still continues as she says young people have the power to change the world. Olivia was the winner of the Diana Award two years ago, set up by Diana's sons, Prince William and Prince Harry, to recognize young people for their social action and humanitarian work. Olivia's cause? Raising thousands for teenage cancer patients and campaigning to end sexism in girls' soccer. Do you think people your age, your peers, are aware of who Diana was? I'm sure they are because she's definitely a big name and such an inspiring woman. Diana was the world's original influencer, using her image and style to draw the spotlight to causes she cared about. You can see her influence on so many modern day influencers doing exactly the same thing that Diana always did. In a way saying, look at me, look at me, but then saying more importantly, listen to me. Something we all need to do more of. Listen to each other with patience and compassion. Kelly Kobiea, NBC News, London. We thank Kelly for that report and we thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.